welcome everyone. This is the ninth offering in our 2020 resiliency webinar series uh, that we present live, generally the second and the fourth Thursdays of the month. Um, so definitely mark your calendars for our next webinar, which is going to be Thursday, November 5th at 1 p.m. with Debbie Hastelow and Tom Allenstein. Uh, this will be a conversation about the benefits of therapy animals, uh, comfort animals and service animals and the differences between them. Uh, so definitely uh, mark your calendars and, and join us that day. Today we're excited, however, to be hearing from uh, Dr. Shannon Sovendahl on the power of positive in a fragile world. Shannon will be sharing with us insights he's gained over his career, which he turned into uh, an Amazon best-selling book, Fragile, Beauty and Chaos, Grace and Tragedy, and the Hope that Lives in Between a personally inscribed copy of which, by the way, is available to any $500 plus donor to the Medevac Foundation International. Reminder to our live attendees, if you have a, a question to pose your, uh, to the speaker, please use the Zoom Q&A tool provided at the bottom uh, there. And Shannon's going to be sharing his screen so that he can walk you through a PowerPoint presentation. Um, it should be what you see the largest on your screen, but if at any point it switches between uh, him and the, the PowerPoint, you're always able to click on whatever's the smallest and make it larger as well. So uh, just a note for those of you that are viewing live. Uh, but again, use the Zoom Q&A tool that's provided when you think of any question and we'll add it to the queue. Um, and when we get to the end, I'll moderate the questions for Shannon. So in describing uh, his talk, Shannon said, what we do, it's not like what it is on TV, watching someone die. Shows like Grey's Anatomy makes it all seem so cool and dramatic. Music playing in the background, uh, pain facial expressions on good looking actors. But when a patient dies, when our patients die, um, it, it's not such great drama. Uh, it bites away a piece of my soul like a service charge for the job. Like so many of you, Shannon started in medicine ready to be a hero, but he just had no idea what the personal cost would be. Uh, EMS work draws you in too far if you let it, but if you can manage it, uh, with the tools the foundation is trying to provide uh, through these webinars and our taking care of our own series of in-person events that we've also held uh, before, the event horizon opens everything up. Uh, right there on the cusp, devastation or exhilaration, as Shannon says, you need to tiptoe on the edge of despair to know life. The fear and loss opens up joy and amazement. It's like uh, one leads to the other. Let me rephrase that, one allows the other, as he says. So as the executive director of the Medevac Foundation International and on behalf of the board, staff, volunteers, and especially our donors and sponsors uh, who collectively make all of the taking care of our own um, help is on the way programming possible, I welcome all of you. Uh, I hope that you'll take as much away from today's session as I know I'm looking forward to taking away with me. Uh, we had almost 90 people register for this webinar, and we know that hundreds more will tune in as part of the archives uh, on their own time. So if you're joining us after the fact, thanks also for seeking us out. Uh, now we'll hear from Jared Hughes, the Foundation's Development Director, to introduce our speaker. Jared. Thanks, Garrett. Before I introduce our guest today, I want to make uh, my pitch for our Run to Help the Helpers. It's an annual run, walk, roll, swim, golf challenge that started in May, and it's running through the end of the year. We have 201 participants so far, and that puts us well over last year's total, just over halfway to our goal to break our all-time participant record of 400 people. Uh, with the folks signing up for one or several event, one of several events available from all abilities from a one mile family fun run to a thousand mile cycling fundraising challenge from our board chair, Howard Dragsdale. Uh, by the way, everyone, I wanna congratulate Howard on reaching his 1000 mile goal last month. Uh, since the weather is still good, Howard's going to keep riding for us this year until the weather stops cooperating, and we continue to cheer him on towards meeting his fundraising goal of $71,000 before his 71st birthday. So if you haven't made a gift already, please consider sponsoring him or one of our other participants. 
I want to give a special shout out to our many individual donors and corporate sponsors to date. Uh, Metro Aviation, Lifelink 3, Apollo MedFlight, Kames, Leonardo, and most recently, LifeFlight Network that has offered to underwrite the registration of at least 300 of their employees. Uh, you can sign up to run yourself or sponsor the mileage of one of the participants at medevacfoundation.org or by Googling run to help the helpers. Now to our speaker. I'm honored to have Dr. Shavin, Shannon Sovendahl with us today. Uh, we've had great interest in our posts about this presentation from all over the world with people organically sharing our posts hundreds of times. Uh, Shannon is the author, uh, as Garrett said, of his memoir, Fragile, Beauty and Chaos, Grace and Tragedy and Hope that Lives in Between. It examines the tenuous balance between trying to compartmentalize the trauma of tragedy while preserving his own humanity. Fragile puts, pulls back the curtain on the ER to reveal universal truths about the human condition if one pauses long enough to take a breath. Shannon's also the author of two books on competitive cycling. Shannon and his wife, Stephanie, who is also in the EMS world, produce Match on Fire, Medicine and More podcast, it released on the first and third Wednesdays of each month where they discuss hot topics in emergency medicine with the goal of bringing the best care as aggressively as possible to patients. Emergency providers, paramedics, EMTs, firefighters, and first responders will enjoy the straightforward and gritty approach to patient care as well as the honest reflections on the personal price of answering the call. He's also the founder and principal of 300 Training Group that provides basic to advanced medical education with a patient-focused approach. You can learn more about these resources on his website, drsovendahl.com. Shannon is a board-certified doctor in both emergency medicine and emergency medical services. Dr. Sovendahl attended medical school at Columbia University, where he earned the prestigious Arnold P. Gold Foundation's Humanism in Medicine Award, and he completed his residency at Stanford University. Dr. Sovendahl has a wide range of career experience working in tactical medicine with the FBI, as a team doctor for the Garmin professional cycling team, and as a flight physician. He currently works as an emergency physician and medical director for EMS agencies and fire departments from his home base in, Colorado, in Boulder, Colorado, uh, where, which he shares with his family. I know the medical... Medevac Foundation International is looking forward to help, helping his vision of gifting a pop, copy of Fragile to every new medical resident during their white coat ceremony and every newbie medical transport prof professional become a reality. Uh, Dr. Sovendahl, we're thrilled to have you with us and are grateful to you for your life's work and for your service to the Medevac Foundation International as one of our newest board members. We're very much looking forward to collaborating with you and your Power of Positive Foundation engaging your fresh eyes and your uniquely positive vision. Shannon, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, thanks, Jared. You guys hear me okay? Yeah, and okay. thanks, Garrett, uh, as well. And thanks for Medevac Foundation for having me. Um, I appreciate it and I'm excited to be here. That was, uh, I sound quite serious with that introduction. So uh, <laughs> thanks, Jared, I'm not quite that serious of a guy. So I do appreciate the introduction. I thought um, I would start today and hopefully this doesn't bore you all. Um, I'll just watch the numbers as <laughs> if they stay or go. But I was going to start by just reading a passage from Fragile um, because I feel it, it encompasses kind of what I was thinking when I wrote this and what we as providers uh, have to deal with. Um, the chapter is called Zebra, and every chapter in the book is associated with a song um, and an artist. And so the, the chapter Zebra is associated with Lunatic Fringe by Red Rider. I remember standing motionless in the doctor's lounge, staring at my hands. Things had changed. I was someone different, someone my friends and family might not recognize if I let them in, really let them see my true soul. But that wasn't possible, not for me. I was too guarded, always guarded, always in control. It wasn't just today that had changed me. It had been everything. All I wanted to do was see my boys. I wanted proof that they were safe at home. I wanted to see them alive, well, laughing and playing, finding joy in the little things like Legos, action figures, and our dog, Ryder. Instead, I was alone, feeling the frantic drone of a busy emergency department. There was no time for reflection or emotion. Patients were waiting to be seen. Trauma Room 11 had just given me a cold taste of reality. No superhero saves or knights in shiny armor. Just the simple fact that sometimes really bad things happen. In the background, the TV mounted in the corner of the room played ESPN baseball highlights. 
With the excitement of a lottery winner, the well-groomed commentator extolled the virtues of Alex Rodriguez because he had hit yet another home run. He makes close to $58,000 every time he steps to the plate. I guess he deserves it, the pressure and all. I didn't take note of who won the game. I can only recall Alex. I stood like a zombie in the middle of the lounge, numb, like a poor zebra you see on Animal Planet after having one of its legs chomped off by a hidden crocodile during compulsory river crossing in Tanzania. The look, that look, on the zebra's face always struck me as a bit misplaced because it was devoid of any apparent emotion or concern. Moments from death, try put potting on the far shore, the zebra appeared totally detached and dissociated from its dire predicament. As I stood there, I felt the same as that zebra, vacant of any emotional content. I understood the look. I shouldn't have been able to push my emotions aside, not if I possessed some small fleck of compassion or empathy, because this wasn't normal. This wasn't people experienced day to day, at least not normal people. But I had been trained to be this way. No panic, just a calm journeyman's approach to any affliction, like a mathematician working in an equation. Years of preparation, acquiring a skill set, building up my vault, had readied me to stand in the lounge like a zebra. And so I stared at my hands to see if I was actually here, to see who I was. Maybe I was hoping to see something different, anything really, a tremble, a shake. But all I saw was my hands, steady, solid, and quiet. The clock clicked 821. It was one of those old school clocks like you would see on the wall back in grade school. I had zoned out looking at a similar clock at my son's last parent teacher conference. The second hand was rigid and jerky, making a big move forward, then a small move back. Big forward, small back. Everything fits together like the pieces of a giant puzzle. The picture becomes clear only when the dark colors blend with the bright. The picture is revealed because of the unity of pieces. I felt the seconds ticking, moving forward from 821. Even though it didn't look like it, deep down, the last 30 minutes had kicked my ass. From the outside, I was calm, but somewhere inside, the hideous reality of death and suffering screamed and rattled in my well-guarded cage. So that is the uh, um, intro passage to Fragile. Um, and it was right after I had a, a, a child pass away in the ER. and so. I started to write that book because I was thinking about all these emotions that I was having when, you know, when you experience that as a healthcare provider. And so we'll get into that a little bit in this um, talk here. Let me just move forward. Get my slideshow to work. Hold on. So first, I want to just start by thanking all of you for being here. Um, I really appreciate the work you're doing. I mean, we're in the middle of a pandemic and it's, um, you know, unprecedented time, but I'm so proud of all the people that I work with and all the healthcare providers, all the essential workers, everyone showing up to work. I mean, they all come to work ready to do their job. And, you know, we are moving forward into winter time and we're going to have another uh, spike in this pandemic likely. And, you know, everyone's getting tired, but I just want to say thank you for hanging in there, for showing up and, and really doing your part. So I had an awesome introduction by, um, Jared, so thank you. I was going to introduce myself, but I don't need to talk about myself anymore. I do have this picture of AirMed One uh, because my goal in life is that one day I will have a helicopter that just has my name on it. This is not my helicopter, obviously, but that would be like a win in life if you get a helicopter with your name on it. So this is the, the um, fragile. This is the book, Beauty and Chaos, Grace and Tragedy, and the Hope that Lives in Between. And really, um, I took a long time coming up with that subtitle because fragile us being in a fragile world might sound negative and really it creates a, a fair amount of hope at least hope for me and all the stuff that i'm talking about today is how i think about things and obviously how um i've experienced them and, and, and how i'm trying to make sense of it all this is not uh, me telling you you know what you should be thinking i just wanted to give you my perspective and then you can take that home and mull it over you know as you guys um deal with the same stressors that i'm dealing with so what is amazing right now is life is fragile, right? Life is truly fragile. And what's phenomenal about this is it's not just you and me experiencing that life is fragile because we had this unique experience. It's all the state of Colorado, of California, of New York. It's all of the US. It's all of the world. Everybody is experiencing that life is fragile. And it's scary because this is a new thing where it's universal. Everyone feels fragile. And 
when I, when I had this book come out, you know, it was almost odd. It, it's odd that I'm wearing a mask on the cover of this book. This book was written over years. The cover was chosen over a year and a half ago for this book. And I'm wearing this mask. And then it is released in the middle of a pandemic. And really this mask represents everybody now. We're all having to be protected from the pandemic. We're all experiencing how life is fragile. And it's, uh, it's, it's crazy to me that this was the selection that we had prior to all of this happening. I, like a lot of people in medicine, got in it because I wanted to be a hero. I mean, I was not planning on being a doctor. I went to the Air Force Academy and then I ended up studying economics. I raced bikes. And as a summer job, I worked on an ambulance. And one day we had a nasty patient that had a run in with an auger and his leg was messed up. And we called the helicopter to come take the patient. And as that helicopter flew in, I was like, wow, that's the epitome of being a hero. Like this helicopter's flying in. You know, when people get into trouble, we call 911. When 911 gets into trouble, they call the helicopter. And I was like, this is the um, uh, amazing rescue here. And I had this vision that that's what I wanted to do. I want to be a hero. I want to be the rescue for the rescue. Like that would be great. The tough part of that is I never thought about the flip side. I never thought about what is the cost of trying, you know, to be the hero. And this picture here, it's not a great picture because it's from the internet, but this was a viral uh, image. And this is an ER doctor who had lost a patient and he came outside and he needed a moment. He sat down on the wall. He was tearful. He was upset. And, and the internet went crazy because they were like, look at this doctor that, that is so compassionate and feeling. And the thing that struck me about this picture is that why is that surprising? You know, it's, it's not surprising that you should be affected by these people suffering and being around you. And I'm not gonna lie um, to you guys here that, that I'm strong and fine because throughout my whole career, I've struggled with these emotions, these feelings of, you know, kind of despair that come on. And it's all from what we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. It's the impact of seeing suffering. It's the impact of causing suffering and pain in my treatments. I'm placing a chest tube or a central line and the person doesn't like it. It's the impact of me failing my patients my failure, they die and coming home with that. It's the impact of feeling cold and calculated when I'm inter intervening with my patients because I have to stay in the game. I can't, I can't emotionally get too involved because I have to go take care of another patient. And all of these feelings, they start to overwhelm me as I'm you know, proceeding with my career. And I call it the black hole. And the reason it's a black hole is because it's relentless and it doesn't stop. And sometimes you can't escape and you feel yourself getting pulled into this black hole of kind of these emotions that you know you, you're not always able to share with other people and and you you find yourself being drawn deeper and deeper in and at times i think medicine and doing healthcare it asks too much um and it's like gravity it's relentlessly pulling every photon of life out of your soul and if you're not careful you know it will suck you in and we come home at night and we're sitting in the dark by ourselves or in the hallway of the hospital and you have all these questions as why didn't i do this or that why does this happen? Why do people suffer? Why do people die? Why me? And they start to build up, right? And it starts to get out of control. It's like a tsunami taking you over and you feel, you know, like you're drowning. You're drowning because of all these whys and these sensations that you're feeling. And it can feel very much alone when you're doing that. But what I want to tell you is that honestly, that's not where it ends. And that really is only half the story. Being in that terrible bad place is just part of that story and it creates the whole story and for me again i'm not telling anybody else what they should feel but what i've come to realize over the past 24 years of doing this is that that place that dark spot is exactly the place that i needed to go i i needed to go there at some point in order to be living the life that i'm living and so I'll be the first to admit it. If you, if you hope to you know, buy my book or hear me talk and you, you're looking for an answer, there is no answer, okay? I don't have an answer. It is too complex and crazy to have an answer. And I, unfortunately, I also don't have a Zen moment, a moment when everything becomes clear and we can sit back and fully relax. I just haven't found the answer or the Zen moment. I'm, I'm sorry if that's uh, what you were expecting, but I will tell you this, I have come to have a very clear observation. And this is my observation, okay? 
I really, really love my kids. I'm pretty to my wife is an understatement. I love big, complicated things like black holes and time. I love simple things like a sunrise, like a smile. The moon is pretty phenomenal. It comes up every day almost. And sometimes it's eclipsed. It's totally phenomenal. And so how do I come to this sense, this feeling? How did I get here to say I want to be in the dark spot so that I can appreciate the simple and complex things in my life? This is a picture of my daughter, Sabea. And she had open heart surgery when she was three months old. And so having someone you love suffer and have their heart stopped and have their heart restarted and seeing all these tubes out of her, it's a very uh, scary, fragile, dark place. But to be honest, at this point, I wouldn't change any of that for the world because you just saw the picture of Savea, the Savea at the pumpkin patch with the yellow dress and she has not a care in the world and she's totally fine. It, 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 is a, it is a yin and a yang that they needed to be experienced together. And this picture on the right is her four days later, four days after open heart surgery. And so thanks again to like the healthcare providers that make this happen and um, to the Children's Hospital of Denver that took care of her, the surgeon that took care of her, you know, I'm in awe of the work that they did. I was embarrassed to say that I'm a doctor and I'm gonna stand next to this other guy that I call a doctor, but he operates on kids' hearts. So we're, we're, we're not the same. And so that whole feeling of being fragile, of feeling the loss, you know, that needed to happen for me. Um, and all these images of awe and emotion, they didn't just come from nowhere. You know, they didn't come for free. The cost was my opening up and my allowing myself the risk and having that loss. That's what sets the stage. And without that stage, I don't have anything, anything that I hold value to. And what's my risk? My risk is losing someone I love. It's the picture on the left. It's having your, your daughter have open heart surgery. The risk is living life. And that life is going to feel the whole gamut of things, right? It's going to be good and bad. And there's no way to have one without the other. And in the intro, he said it. One allows the other. You have to have both of them. Um, and I feel like I need to be sitting right on that event horizon, right next to that black hole almost being sucked in, but pulling away to fully experience the joy that I have in my kids or the sunrise or a smile and all of those things. So that brings me to the last uh, part of uh, my talk, which is gonna be about surfing. And you might say, why does he wanna talk about surfing? And I think that it's a very good analogy for me in my mind of how all of this stuff works. So when you surf and you're sitting out there in the swell, you can feel the power of the wave coming under you and it starts to pick you up and you decide to start to paddle for that wave. And there's two options. You're going to have two options at this point. You were either going to pop up on your surfboard and have a magnificent, exhilarating ride, you know, in and out of the, the pipe. It's just phenomenal. Or that wave is going to gobble you up. It could slam you down. You could hit your head on the ground. You could actually die from this. And those two extremes, exhilarating life, potential death, all of those extremes are what makes it so encompassing. Now, when you surf, there are two safe spots surfing. You can sit on the shore or you can sit outside the swell. And if you're in those two spots, you're relatively safe. But from those two spots, you can't surf at all. So only when you move into that middle section where the waves are happening, when you decide that I'm going to try to ride this wave, that's the only time that you get a ride. And it's the only time you have a chance to feel the exhilaration of love or your bride walking down the aisle or whatever it is that, that, that invigorates you in life, right? There's only the potential of doing that when you have the potential of the loss of the risk. And so sitting on that wave, waiting to paddle, you have to make that decision. Am I gonna sit on the shore outside the break or am I gonna get in there and paddle? And for sure, I've made the decision to try to paddle and I'll suffer through those losses. Don't get me wrong, I'm gonna paddle like hell when the wave comes because I do not wanna crash. But Ultimately, I have the option of crashing or riding an exhilarating ride. And so those are the extremes. And really what I want you to take home from this is that there's no easy answer and there's no answer that someone else can give you. It's only the answer for you, but I've truly come to feel that you, you, know, you need to experience all of it and you can't have one without the other and nothing's for free. And the cost of that is the risk of the loss. So if you guys have any um, questions, I don't know if anyone popped up questions, I can look. Um, oh, there's a couple of uh, 
questions. There's one in the Q&A, but um, I had a couple of others that were interesting that I wanted to uh, circle back with you on. So um, one, thank you again for coming and giving this talk today. Um, but two, could you talk a little bit more about your book? You know, for instance, what's your favorite uh, part or chapter in the book and why? Um, my favorite part, and if there's, you know, health care providers out there here, I hope that you you appreciate this. My, my favorite um, part of the book is it, it's a chapter called um, Cocktail Party. And the cocktail party is a, a, a true story. It's me at a cocktail party with my wife and I'm not really social. Um, I don't like to go to cocktail parties, but I, I have to go with her because she's very social. And um, in that party, someone came up to me, you know, and this is not an atypical thing. They're like, oh, you're an ER doctor. You know, have you seen someone die? Oh, you know, have you ever seen a lot of people die? Like they want to ask these questions. What's the grossest thing you've ever seen? What's the most terrible thing you've ever seen? And for me, it's a reflection there when, you know, the person is asking those questions, the things that I've experienced and seen, they're, they're not cocktail stories. They're not, you talk about the Kardashians at a cocktail party. You don't talk about someone dying or the worst thing I've seen because I don't want to share with you the worst thing I've seen unless I can give you the context and the background. And I think a lot of healthcare providers feel that. They feel like, you know, this isn't, this isn't a minimal thing. This is a very profound thing. And when you ask me at a cocktail party, what's the worst thing that I've seen? I'm actually running through a top 10 list like David Letterman, but that's not a funny thing. That's me actually feeling the emotion of those terrible things that I've seen. And so I, I like this chapter because I feel like for someone who's not in healthcare, it gives them a glimpse of, you know, when you ask these questions and you flippantly ask them while you're sipping your wine, you know, there's a lot more emotion to it than just, uh, tell me a cool story. No, that's, that's very true. And um, thank you for sharing that. Um, one other question that, that popped up um, that I think is probably something a lot of folks that are in our industry are dealing with is, um, you know, how do you manage raising a family uh, with two EMS professionals and particularly, you know, with the added stress of the current pandemic? You know, how, how are you all uh, managing to, to remain human, remain kind, uh, and, and muddle through. Well, uh, if some of you are on here that know me, I used to have hair. So that's one thing that's different. Um, I mean, it is tough, you know, it, it is tough. People think that, um, because you're both in healthcare, that that makes it easier. And I'm not sure that's the case because you want to escape a little bit when you get home. So I, I don't necessarily want to hear about, you know, Stephanie's terrible call, but she wants to, you know, get it off of her chest. So, I think it's a very tricky thing uh, when you're both doing that and the pandemic adds a huge amount of stress. I think that it's super important to recognize that it adds a huge amount of stress. And, you know, I'm an inpatient person at baseline and I feel even more impatient. And I understand that that's my stress coming out as I start to feel it winding up. I get impatient with my kids and the dogs and everything that we're doing, right? And recognizing those things and being able to be self-aware that, hey, okay, I need to take a moment. I need to calm down. And it's because we go to work and we deal with the stress of work as normal. And then we come home and we're still dealing with pandemic stress because everyone's dealing with that. And we're dealing with people and families, you know, having the normal jobs and, and all of these things. So I think it's very tricky to recognize that you are under a huge amount of stress um, and take time out to like get away from it. You know, whatever that is for you that, that relieves your soul a little bit. No, that's excellent. And related to something that uh, someone else was asking actually, which was, um, you know, how have you come to this level of balance around the tragedy that we see, um, you know, counseling, coaching, writing, journaling, talking with peers, you know, what are the coping mechanisms, right? Um, and so I think uh, another person in the chat mentioned that it's going to be different for everyone, um, which we, we know to be true. But I mean, if you want to talk just a little bit more about uh, maybe some things that you've heard from some of your peers that are also, you know, trying to find their own balance, that'd be great. Well, I think the key is, is um, what you said. It's different for everybody. There's not a book that, that you read and it gives you the answer. And that's what I was trying. I, 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 I relay that in my book. And I try to be very clear in my book that this is my thought of dealing with it. And I think that there's a lot of crap out there um, that is trying to push self-help on you. And so you really need to be aware of what works for you. And no one has, if they're telling you they have the absolute right answer, they probably don't have the right answer for you because it's slightly different. And really, to me, what you need to do is, is be honest and have an honest discussion with yourself. And, and I talk about the mirror test and the pillow test. 
The pillow test is when you lay down at night, you feel comfortable with everything you've done in the day, meaning that you feel like you've, you know, been honest, you've given your best shake. And when you look in the mirror, you can, you can't run away from that, you know, like, and if you're trying to make excuses in the mirror, then that's a problem. And so the first piece of when you're dealing with all this emotion is to acknowledge that you have it, that you're not weak because you're feeling it. Um, you're, you're apps, you're actually the opposite when you're dealing with it, you're, you're confronting a, a terrible monster, right? And you're going to look at this face to face and figure out how to do it. My, my biggest thing that I've found over the years is you have to do it in, um, in manageable chunks. And, and let me give you an example, and this might not apply to anyone, but say you have a song that really affects you and I'm affected by songs. That's why they're in my book. And I start listening to that song and I decided to listen to that song over and over because it's making me feel this emotion or remember a kid dying or something like that. I, I can't listen to that song over and over. I have to be mindful that I can pull myself too far into that black hole. And so you have to do it in biteable chunks. You have to say, hey, I'm going to think about this. I'm going to deal with this, but then I'm going to go for a walk with the dogs or I'm going to play the piano or I'm going to watch a movie, do something that pulls you out of that hole because it is slippery and if you're not careful it can pull you in when you're getting into those dark moments and so that's what i've experienced from, from myself is that i just have to be mindful of how much i'm reflecting on it it is absolutely good to reflect but then i have to pull back a little bit i have to take a break and then uh, hit it again another time yeah and you know something um that was really interesting i mean uh, uh hearing you talk about what you went through with your daughter and also i mean that uh there had to be some um, sense of a loss of control, right? Because you're also a doctor. So, you know, you, you, you're talking to another doctor who's going out to do this important work for you. Um, and of course, there, there's that idea that I know what I want to see, I know what's best. And, um, you know, one of the questions I have is, do you feel that having gone through that with your, your daughter um, helps or hinders when you're then, you know, seeing uh, trauma with other children. Um, because as you're talking about that black hole, for instance, I'm just thinking about how um, it's not just the sound, right, that we hear. So yes, music, it can be a very uh, good and bad trigger for us. Um, but to that end, you know, sights as well. So when you're now looking at a child and, you know, does it sometimes pull you back to where your daughter was? And how do you deal with the, the sight that also takes you back to those times? I think that this is uh, this is a piece that I discuss a lot in Fragile, and it's that that zebra chapter that I told you about. Is that you actually have to train yourself to become detached. So to be a good provider in the moment, I've been trained to detach myself, and so I I can do that, and it, it gives me grief because I am detached during the moment, and I feel when I come home like how could I be like that? How could I? not engage with this family or sit with them the way I should. And in reality, I work in a single cover GR. There's no other doctor there. I, I have to disengage and go do something else. And that is that has um, bothered me for a long period of time that, that you, you can do this, but there, you can't hide from it. And meaning that that emotion is going to come out at some point. So, my, you know, my wife jokes at me. I watch, you know, a corny movie. I'm watching The Notebook and I start getting a tear in my eye, right? I get upset. I have to get up. And she's like, are you getting upset during the notebook? You know, it's not the notebook, right? It's something from that movie that's now triggering something that I saw and I'm dealing with the emotion. And I think that's really critical for all of us is that you can't hide it away. You can't, you can't, as hard as we try to lock it up in our little vault, you know, and I have my own vault as well. I try to lock it up in there. It's going to seep out at some point. And so um, you can get triggered. And there are times when I have a kid and I start to think, um, you know, like, oh my gosh, this is reminding me of my kids. And then I really mentally go through the process of how do I, how do I put up my wall? How do I keep processing this in the moment? Uh, you know, and a lot of healthcare providers, a lot of EMS providers are very good at that. You know, they, they are, they're good until they go home and turn off the light. And that's why we get into problems. So it's funny that you, you bring that up. Um, one of the things that's kind of going around in the chat box right now is, uh, uh, one of the participants mentioned, it feels like this crisis is ongoing. Coming home feels like stepping away for a washroom break, like there's still so much to do. Um, and, you know, 
I think that that's what most people are really struggling with right now is the fact that it's uh, ongoing. We're worried about not just the patients that are in front of us, but our loved ones that, you know, we can't go see, for instance, um, and, and so forth. Um, someone else wrote, you know, they agreed with Terry. They have moments that they can um, flash back to scenarios from 30 years ago that are as clear now as they were uh, when they were happening or processing her uh, day at home. You know, did I fail my patients? Family says I have to become, or family says that I have become hardened and cold because uh, removing uh, all the emotion is easier, you know? So I think that a lot of people really resonate with exactly what you were talking about right now. Um, but are there any other words? I mean, I think that you've done a, a pretty great job of being you know, pretty clear today, but are there any other thoughts or words you would pass on to the first responders who are struggling? Again, I mean, I wish there was a magic um, answer and there's not. I, I, I think that it is, you know, accepting that you have these emotions and acknowledge them and it's, it's okay. You're actually being strong when you acknowledge them and you face them. Um, doing it in small chunks, meaning don't get, don't sit in, in the dark alleys of your house at night, drinking alcohol, mulling over this for hours on end. That's not a healthy way to do it. You know, you need to kind of really address it. You need to talk with people that do the same thing as you do. I think that's important. And even if you're, um, you know, tell your wife everything or your husband everything, but they're not in healthcare. I mean, I think you need to talk to someone who understands, you know, the stressors that you're doing. I've been very fortunate that um, one of my partners in emergency medicine here in Boulder was a doctor that I trained. We went to residency together. We got our jobs here together. So we've had very similar life experiences, which makes it very easy for me to quickly tell him a story and he knows, you know, where I'm coming from. And I think having a, some sort of support group like that is, is very important as well. And then finally, don't forget to do something that you, that you love, meaning you, whatever that thing is in your life that's outside of work and, you know, even family and things like, you know, I love jujitsu. Like I need to go do jujitsu. And the pandemic has really made a struggle for me because that has been my outlet and I can't do that during the pandemic. Um, so it, you need to find something else, something else that kind of rejuvenates your soul. And the comments right on is that, you know, you go home and you feel like it's just a quick break because there's so much to do and you got to go back out in the fight and all of that. I mean, you really need to say, you know, I, I need a uh, time out. Like I need to take a break for a minute and then I'll get back in the fight. Yeah. And, you know, self-care we know is so important. Um, recently, there's been, you know, uh, some reporting in wellness circles about toxic positivity um, and how, you know, too much of a good thing can become a burden or counterproductive. Um, how do you gauge when that is? Well, I think that, I mean, absolutely. That's not a, that's not a, not a new thing. And that's actually in my book, meaning, you know, when you're a little kid and you, you get caught with a pack of cigarettes, you get caught with a bag of chocolates and your parents put you in the closet and make you eat the whole bag or smoke the whole pack, right? Quickly, you're not that happy with this thing that you thought was cool. Um, and so everything, you know, everything in moderation is, is the saying that goes back for, you know, centuries probably. And, and I think it is absolutely true. The, the, I do think that that term, the toxic positivity, it just relates to our environment a little bit is that you, you know, people, um, think that they have to be happy all the time. And, and I don't think that that's the case. I don't think that that's, that, that should be your goal or that should be uh, what we're striving for is to be happy, right? What, what I'm striving for daily is to live life to the fullest and get the experience and then process that experience. Because what's gonna happen with that is as I see that whole spectrum and range, it's gonna allow me to have those absolutely brilliant moments that I wouldn't have experienced before but if I was happy all the time, I, I would never get there, right? It would just become the new normal. And I, and I talk about that a lot <laughs> um, when I'm, you know, I talk about what if there's al alternative universes, right? And I can have a happy me in any universe and I could just jump to the happy me whenever I wanted to, like that wouldn't be that great. You know, I've actually sat down and thought about this. Like, would I like that? And, and the answer is no, you know, I wouldn't like that. I need to have the dark moments overall to have the happy moments that there's just no way around it. No, that's an excellent uh, point and very well said. Uh, there was one request uh, while you were chatting to present this at AMTC 2021. Uh, so I wanna make sure that we, we let you know that folks would love to hear this again. 
Um, I'll pause there. I've asked, I think, all of the questions that have come through, but let's pause and see if anyone else has one uh, that they'd like to get in front of you. I have a, just a comment while we're waiting that someone, yeah. Terry Dillon wrote um, that they would like to get the audio book. And I have a funny, I have a funny story about the audio book. So I recorded the audio book. So it's me uh, reading the book and you know, I'm not a freshman writer. Hands down, the hardest part of this book is the audio book. It's hard, harder than writing a book, just as a side note. So they, uh, you have to read, you know, very, um, you have to have really good diction. You have to read slow. They want it with feeling. And then they can't have any sound whatsoever uh, in the background. So I actually had to make a PVC pipe square rigging. I laid 10 blankets over the rigging. I would sit inside the little cubby hole that I made with my podcast mic and I would read the book and I'd have to do it like each chapter like 20 times. It was absolutely painful. So if you get the audiobook, just know how much pain <laughs> went into the audiobook. My <laughs> wife would turn on the sink upstairs and the monitor would show like noise. And I'd be like, oh my gosh, I got to do it again. I would come upstairs. I'm like, you turn on the faucet. She's like, what are you talking about? So it was pretty funny. Well, we're glad that you you suffered through that. And, <laughs> yeah, and that. It was suffering. It was terrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I haven't seen any additional questions come through. Um, I've just seen lots of comments saying that, you know, they really appreciate you, really appreciate uh, what you've shared and that, um, you know, the book is very powerful. Uh, and several others have said here that they're uh, either just about to or have already downloaded the audio book. Um, I guess there's one last question that we can we can ask. Uh, did you have an epiphany or a light bulb moment that changed how you viewed um, your relationship with the profession and how it affects you mentally? Uh, the answer is no, no epiphany. Um, I would call it a slow blog, a slow dredge <laughs> through the whole thing. Um, and there are times in this career uh, that I thought I made a major mistake. Like I, I was like, this was a bad choice for me. And, and when I say that, um, I'm not saying that there's no kind of doctor I would rather be, meaning I couldn't see myself not being an ER doctor. Um, but it was rather that I chose to be a doctor, chose to be in healthcare. Um, and there was, like I said, you know, I had really dark times with this where I was super unhappy and depressed and uh, struggled through. And the that has led me to where I am now. Like I actually really enjoy my job. I enjoy going to ER, I enjoy work. And it, it's because I think I've figured out a balance of how much work you can do, how much you can expose yourself to um, and how much time you rejuvenate from that exposure. Um, and then appreciating kind of the whole, the whole spectrum. You know, I, I definitely live by the mantra, you know, when I go to work, you can't hurt me. I want the fight. I want all of these things, you know, um, David Goggins style, if you've read his book, um, you know, that's how I approach work. But when I come home, I'm like, I have to let that go and I have to um, recuperate. Otherwise it's not going to go well. So um, there's been no aha moment. And unfortunately, if there was, I would put it in a book and hopefully, you know, it would be a bestseller, but I don't, I don't have that, that answer. What I was trying to give you in my book is, you know, honest truth, honest reflection of let's not hide from what we feel or, you know, if someone saw me in the ER, they'd be like, look at that ER doctor. He's competent and fine and he never lets anything rattle him. Hey, I'm rattled, man. I'm rattled when I come home, just like you are. So, um, you know, I wanted that just to be out there for everybody. No, oh, much appreciated. Uh, okay, this is the, the, the last question for sure. How has bicycling uh, helped you manage stress? <laughs> um, People, what's funny, so I, you know, I, I rode bikes a lot and then I work with the cycling team. And once you do something professionally, you know, I race bikes and then I work with this pro cycling team, it becomes less of a pastime. <laughs> um, so, you know, when you're in the sport and it's a job and, and people, you know, say, oh, that's awesome. You go to the Tour de France and you go to the Tour of Italy and you're doing all these races in Europe. Um, it was, I was, I think, eight years in and I had to go to Milan to do a Tour of Italy, a Giro uh, race. And I was complaining that I had to go to Europe. I was like, ah, I got to go to Milan tomorrow. I don't want to go. And the person looked at me and they're like, you're complaining about going to Milan. And I was like, yeah, I probably should look at not doing this job anymore. Right. Like, because that doesn't make sense when you kind of say that. And so the long winded answer to your question is I've slowly gotten back into riding bikes. Now I hadn't been riding bikes for the last 
four or five years, I ride a lot of dirt bikes, a lot of motorcycles, which makes um, bicyclists angry here in Boulder. But um, <laughs> so I've been more of a moto off-road guy, but now I've been getting back into my bike with the pandemic. And it's actually, I, I've re um, invigorated myself. I'm like, wow, I really like riding my mountain bike. So it's, so it's great. Well, good, good. Well, thank you so very much, Shannon, for uh, being here with us today, for taking the time to share with others um, that it's okay to be human. Um, at the end of the day, you know, we tell ourselves um, we shouldn't, you know, feel this way, right? We've got to continue to get back out there and, and get things done. And while that's absolutely true, at the end of the day, we are still human. So self-care is important and it's important to recognize where uh, you are in your own journey and uh, where you are with your own emotional status. So we really appreciate you taking time to share with us and writing the book. Um, I look forward to hearing the audio book as well. And uh, I'll definitely be thinking yeah, about yeah. this PVC and 10 blanket fort. Yeah, uh, feel free to make, to make fun of me. Feel free to make fun of me. Anybody <laughs> who's out there who does, uh, you know, if you go to Amazon and you, 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 you do like the book, like it definitely does help the word get out there if you guys write a review so if you whatever your true thoughts on the book write a review on amazon it helps me out a lot um and again you know um it, it's odd i think it's odd to say hey you know go look at my book or go write a review i i, I do feel you, you don't get you don't get rich off of writing a book you know that's not why i'm saying this i'm actually saying this because i want people to um to to see that that there's an option for them and that people that do this job have the same emotion and feelings they do. And, you know, EMTs and paramedics come up to me all the time and they're like, you know, how do you do it? I, I can't say concisely how I do it. I, I can write it down in a book because it takes that many words to say, this is how I deal with it. And um, that's really the answer to the question. Um, and so that that's the avenue I have. No, much appreciated. And uh I think a lot of people got a lot of things out of this. I've seen some some praise coming your way uh, through the chat and really appreciate you taking the time. So uh, thank you for being a board member. Thank you for joining us today and uh, sharing your story. I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day, not only you, but to everyone who's out there listening uh, to this and, and hopefully uh, you'll join us next time. So take care all.